Welcome to both of you. Simon, let's start with you. Who is Simon Squibb? Well, I guess I'm an entrepreneur and I started 19 companies. I'm presently the founder and CEO of HelpBank.com. I've invested in 77 startups, but I, 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 at my core, I'm someone who believes anyone could be an entrepreneur. It's an unpopular opinion, actually, surprisingly, but I believe anybody can, anyone listening can. And in this day and age, you should have the option at least to be an entrepreneur. And I'm on a mission to make sure that people have the option to be whatever they want. And I could not agree with you more than that. But before we dive into that, just tell us a bit about your story, because you were almost forced into entrepreneurship, weren't you, at the age of 15? Yeah, so I, um, at 15 years old, my father suddenly died of a heart attack. And three weeks later, I had an argument with my mum and she kicked me out of home. And I was homeless. And uh, in that time, everybody listening probably knows in England, you can't get a job unless you've got a national insurance card. And you can't get a job if you haven't got an address. And so um, I was yeah, forced into entrepreneurship. It's not something I was ever taught at school, which is wrong. It should have been taught to me at school, but it wasn't. And I had no choice but to start a company. I did try to get a job. I even tried to lie on an application to get a job. And I didn't get a job. And to survive, I had to start a business. And what was that business? I can't imagine anything more stressful than that at the age of 15. It's such a young age. What, what did you do? I, I, I sometimes describe what happened to me as the entrepreneur muscle woke up in my brain. We've all got it in there. And sometimes you need to be in survival mode to discover it. But I walked past a big house that had a really messy garden. And something in my brain just said, why would you have a nice big house and a messy garden? You're probably too busy to take care of that garden. So instinctively, and partly because I was desperate, I knocked on the door of that house and just said, hi, my name's Simon Squibb. I've got a gardening company and I like to take care of your garden. Is it possible? And to my surprise, the person said, sure, great. I haven't had time to look for someone. So this is great. How much do you charge? I picked a number out of the air. I said, 200 pounds a month. And they said, sure, let's give it a go. And that was it. A gardening company was born. And that day I knocked on 110 houses and managed to get 11 people to say that I could be their gardener. And then I realized the next day I didn't have any equipment. So I knocked back on those doors and asked them, could I borrow their equipment to do it? Which they said yes to. So, um, you know, no brochure, no website, no experience in sales, no training entrepreneurship whatsoever. Pretty shy, pretty beaten down kid. And I managed to, to, to make it happen. Well, Simon, what an incredible story. So you had 11 clients. You did get some equipment, did you? Or did you? I, I Actually, I also asked for deposit. So I, I went back and said to one person I knew had some equipment, could I use your equipment? Yeah. But I didn't want the other customers to know I didn't have equipment and look unprofessional. So I, I rented some equipment by asking everybody, the other 10 people, to give me a 50% deposit. And I then went and rented some equipment. But the really funny thing is the week later when I tried to do the work, although I had all the equipment, I had all the customers. I am useless at gardening. It, turns <laughs> out. it is, in fact, quite a skill. And so I, um, I, I then had to recruit some fellow homeless folks to help me and gave them cash in hand, which was very, very good at the time, of course, for everybody. So, so that's what I did. I then I had to hire people because I was useless at the work. So I'm not a gardener. And at that time, I wasn't good at sales. I wasn't good at branding. I wasn't good at anything. And uh, just sheer desperation. Um, the Vikings call this strat strategy uh, burn the boats, by the way. Which oh, is, do they? So it yeah, is an official is that, strategy. Is actually, I didn't know it at the time, but I've since read up on you know what I learned by accident, that if your back is against the wall, it can be a good thing. In fact, yeah. there's actually a competitive advantage to having no money to start a business. Because even that gardening business, um, three months into the gardening business, a competitor knocked on the same doors that I'd knocked on. But they were twice the price. Why? Because they had fancy equipment. They had a fancy ad campaign. They had fancy this and fancy that. I was half their price because I'd rented equipment and because I'd borrowed equipment and because I'd done it myself and used, used a different type of structure to, to service the work. So, so I, was, I, I won, even though someone came in with a million pound plus funded gardening company, I still won. That is incredible. And what I love about what you've just said is you literally learn every business lesson in the book. Sales, recruitment, hustling, you know, leveraging, getting the sale and then sorting out how you're going to deliver what you've sold is a very common business lesson, lesson that people need to yeah, learn. Yeah, and I think a lot of people ask me when they're young what business they should start. I said, just at the beginning, make it simple. Window cleaning business, car yeah. cleaning business, gardening business. It's, it, it might not be glamorous. Today, I have a glamorous business. Today, I have a competitor to LinkedIn. It's all tech and all exciting. But I started as a gardener and not a very good one. You know, sometimes that is the best way. It, it just keep it all simple. And, and you learn all the things, all the, all the things I'm doing today, all the things I've learned have come from building those very simple businesses in the early days. So how did you go from your gardening business at the age of 15 to what, what you're doing today? So a combination of things, luck played a huge role. I don't want to underplay luck. 
a lot of people don't want to talk about luck as a thing because you know I've got a book coming out. If I tell you I was just lucky, well, what was there to read? There's no there's no knowledge, right? Yeah. Of course, there there needs to be a certain amount of application, but luck and luck, it turns out, is hackable. You can get more luck by taking more risk. You know, there is a saying out there: the harder you work, the luckier you get. That yeah. is not true. That is a lie. So you learn along the way that some of these things are not true. But luck is hackable if you are taking risk every day. So I took a risk by knocking on that door yeah. and doing that garden. I took a risk by bringing people on to do the gardening. All of those things are important. Risk is the most important thing. That's how you get more luck. And then a combination of time, focus, and no choice. I mean, I had no choice but to make it work. My first business, the gardening business, actually eventually failed. So I'm sure a lot of your listeners have heard this fact. 90% of businesses fail in the first year. Yeah. That's also a lie. It turns out 23% of businesses fail in the first year. 64% of businesses fail in the first three years. Yeah. Mm. And here's the thing. I have, I'm part of that stat. Right. But a business but, failing doesn't mean it didn't serve so, its goal exactly on the way through. Exactly. That doesn't mean it's a, like for you, that was a lifesaver. If totally. It, if it didn't work well, out. I made money for the first in the first example of 23% businesses failing in the first year, the truth is in that year, I still made money. Yeah. See, this is the thing about failure that people are misunderstanding. You know, it's not good to fail. It's good to learn from failure. And so my first business failed because I didn't realize there was a winter in England. And so the winter <laughs> came and I'm like, oh no, no one wants to take care of their gardens in winter. So it's a really stupid, obvious thing. That's actually what made me fail. It wasn't a lack of ability to sell because that happened naturally over time. Yeah. That wasn't the ability to do the work. It's just a seasonal thing that I didn't have the experience of. So it failed by the winter. But when that failed, I already had that compound learning. So then I could start my next business, which was called Accommodation Express. But basically that business also failed two and a half years in. But if I hadn't had those two failures, I wouldn't be where I am today. I have the life I love today. And I always tell people, don't take advice from people that you, whose life you want. Be very careful taking advice from people whose life you don't want. Yeah. Right? But, but I have the life I want today because of those early failures and that early hardship. So tell us about Help Bank, which is, your, well, we're going to come on to the things you do today. You're obviously a very well-known and built profile on social media and you have Help Bank. Let's start with Help Bank. Well, so Help Bank has really been born from, I've only got so many hours in the day and, and what, what was happening is I, I'm helping people. I'm making content around someone's dream and then I'm trying to help that person's dream happen and I share their content online and it's been amazing with people listening and helping. So it's not just been me helping those people, but the community in social media jumping into the comments and saying, I'll be your customer or I'll buy your product or yeah. I'll support you. And we've even had people raise the money to start their businesses from the community that I serve. But I think um, Help Bank came out of the fact that that community needs a platform to help people. So it's kind of helping people help people. That's kind of how we describe Help Bank. So we do say we're competing with LinkedIn yeah. a little bit, but we're helping each other. So the idea is people do want to help. This is the thing, despite what the media tell us, 99.999% of people are really nice and really want to help in any way they can. And people can help just by retweeting or sharing and stuff like that, right? What, what someone's doing. So we give people a platform that allows them in their time frame, because people are busy, yeah. to help someone. Yeah. And that, that's, that's it, really. But just that's had someone. incredible growth. How many users do you have? So 100,000 users in four months. Yeah, I mean, that's phenomenal. And we've helped 26,000 people who had a problem solve that problem. So it, 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 is, it is important. It's in the early days. Yeah. And we can still get squashed by LinkedIn, let's see. But the point is a platform where people can go and get some help. And, and where people can get help for free forever. We'll never charge people for help. I think this is also missing in society, right? People have structured around give and take. This is what we've been told is the way to live, give and take. It's not the way we're supposed to live. The way we're supposed to live is give without take. Yeah. I'm happier when I help you without any expectation of anything in return. And when I do, I sleep so well at night. I've discovered this myself. If you help someone and have no expectation of anything back, it's so freeing because you realize that's actually how we're built, right? When we used to live in tribes of 5,000, we used to help each other. I'd help you and then you go on to help someone else in the tribe and that person in the tribe would go on to help someone else. Yeah, One yeah. day when I need help, karma, call it what you like, yeah. it comes back to me, but we've forgotten this. We've got so transactional. So Help Bank's there to try and change that mindset and remind us, all of us, that we're here to help each other, that's it. I mean, I totally agree people want to help. At that. And you know, our experience on the ground with the kids going out and selling bracelets is the reaction from adults when they see that is only one of wanting to help. Yes. That is the universal reaction for an adult when they see a kid, which brings us onto your profile because you've been, you know, you're known across all social media platforms for going out and about talking to entrepreneurs. Tell us about your content and the content strategy and some of the people you meet out and about. Content strategy wise, I always wanted to build something that wasn't about me. It is about the people that in the videos. And, and the idea was we want to give people what school doesn't give you, an education about business, 
but do it in a way that we know people want, which is fun. Yeah. So we make the, the videos are fun. They entertain you. And so by accident, you get educated. Right. So we don't want the talking heads. We were like, right, today we're going to talk about how to do sales. Yeah. These are the three steps. And actually, in my early days, I did do that sort of content. There's a lot of that sort of content out there. But I wanted to make it so that it was fun for people, so that people could engage and enjoy and laugh and cry and be happy and it not be so boring format education. So that's the original for format. We go and ask someone their dream. They tell it to us, which is always amazing. Like, wow, that's you. Everyone's got a dream, it turns out. And hearing people's dreams is really, really entertaining. And then helping people actually make it happen. Because often people will say, like recently we had a, a young girl say, um, I want to travel the world, take pictures. That's what I want, but it's never going to happen. So I've got a job I hate right now. And we're like, no, you can make it happen. And so I gave her a strategy to make it happen, which is basically get a sponsor. And then we put that video out. Two weeks later, a sponsor contacted us. Now she's being sponsored to take pictures of travel around the world. Incredible. And one of the things I've noticed from watching your content is the amount of young people that you are coming up to you with business ideas and dreams. Tell us about some of the teenagers and you, you also meet kids. Yeah, well, we can't put young children on camera. So yeah. a lot of the interactions where kids are telling us their dreams, we have to get parent permission, which when we do, we put up the videos. And we actually get hundreds of young kids wanting to tell their story. I mean, when I walked around the streets of Brighton just recently, we had a literally a, probably about 30 young kids on bikes and scooters following us around while we were filming and telling us, shouting out their dreams. It was really lovely. But the, the, I guess the older kids, 16 to, to 28 year old, folks, uh, you know, they're, they're telling us their dreams. And what we're trying to do with those folks is help them remove their own self-sabotage sometimes. Yeah. So a lot of people have got self-doubt. I don't know whether it's a combination of life and school system telling you that success is get an A. And slowly people think that they're not smart or they slowly I'm sure that's a themselves. factor in people's self -doubt. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. I, mean, I mean, frankly, um, you know, I, I, some crazy stat like 80% of A students work for D&E students yeah. later, right? Because at the end of the day, you know, in school, you are taught that getting an A means you're smart. And of course, that, you might be smart, but a certain type of smart. It doesn't mean to say you couldn't start a business. It doesn't mean to say you couldn't do something you love. So a lot of the time in the street, when I'm talking to people, the biggest thing is just trying to make people believe in themselves. Yeah. And I think this generation, known as Generation Alpha, Adele's just written about them. These are children aged from what age, Adele? Who are Generation Alpha? So it's eight to about 14. And um, in a few years, they're going to be entering the workforce, which is really exciting. But at the moment, they're still kind of in those formative years. Uh, we're seeing that they're a lot more entrepreneurial, a lot more kind of passionate about being a self-starter or creating their own kind of business and opportunities in a way that I don't think we've really seen with previous generations, which is really exciting. And the way that Gen Z have already kind of changed the workforce and have brought new ideas and um, the ability to use technology is really exciting. I think we're gonna see the same with Generation Alpha, that they're gonna push us kind of forward and, and push the boundaries of really what we can do in business and entrepreneurship, and that's really exciting. I mean, these kids definitely think differently, don't they? They're not pinning yes. everything on school. What, what was some of the research you found in terms of how many of them are thinking about being their own boss and how many of them are already making their own money or wanting to make their own money? Well, I was shocked to find that three quarters of children actually want to work for themselves. And the vast majority of people in the UK actually work for someone else. And so that really skewed, you know, the statistics of, of what we've sort of seen before. Um, they also are more likely to learn about um, making their own money online, which is where you come in. Um, and they're three times more likely to learn from influencers or from digital resources than from books. And historically, we always think of financial education as, you know, going to class, learning from the textbook, whereas actually it's that more practical knowledge of watching other people do it and applying that knowledge themselves that is the future, which is amazing. And, and seeking out that information themselves shows that they've got a keen interest to learn rather than kind of being lectured to, they're actively engaging and researching and, and learning more about business and the opportunities available to them. I mean, it's almost like they're voting with their feet and Absolutely. showing, you know, we've got three quarters of them adopting this viewpoint and, mm. you know, making money in one way or another. And we're not talking about huge sums, although some children have done incredibly well, but most are just having that very first experience of making money. But the role of tech is massive as well, isn't it, in terms of facilitating both their learning and their execution. I mean, you're right, they're learning off people like Simon and then they're off actioning it thanks to technology. Definitely. Yeah, and I think um, sort of previously children have done tasks maybe in the home or for relatives and earned the money that way and so the money is being sort of given to them 
Whereas actually now more children are going and earning that money themselves. And it's not friends and family. Maybe it is and they, they have a car boot sale or a lemonade stand. But now they're also advertising on social media and it's friends of friends of friends and the network of opportunities to make money is expanding. I was shocked to find that 80% of children um, almost have just earned their own money in the last year in comparison to the numbers before where maybe they didn't have to earn the money themselves, they were given it by a parent. That seems astounding and really exciting because if they're doing that now, what can they do in the future? I, mean, I think it's staggering and amazing that 80% of children, we're talking about British children, have earned money in the last 12 months. And this is not from what they've learned at school that's taught them how to do that, is that Simon? I mean, what do you think about what's being taught in school and then what kids are actually actively seeking out themselves? Yeah, I'm, I mean, I, I, I'm quite anti the present education system. And, and that's not to take away from the people that work in the education system, yeah. you know, teachers working very hard with limited resources, but the system hasn't changed from when I was at school. And, and that, that's ridiculous. You know, because like, the world has changed so much. The world has much, changed. Yeah. I mean, I, even frankly, at degree level, like university and degree, I'm 90% I, of people don't need it. So, but every job now requires a degree. And so I think it's, so, for example, recently um, I've been interviewing someone to join my company and I've been interviewing someone who's got a marketing degree, £50,000 worth of debt, four years doing a marketing degree. And I uh, asked yeah. him a simple question. What are the five ways to make money on TikTok? She doesn't know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so they're not teaching the future in university and in schools for sure. They're teaching the past. Yeah. And sometimes that can be useful. There's some references in the past. History repeats itself, that type yeah. of stuff. But people aren't taught the nuance of what they mean by history repeats itself. So, so, so the actual learnings of the past aren't really useful in the real world. And so I, I, I think there is a need, and the reason I, I'm probably doing quite well on social media, to teach people for free, as schools yeah. should do, teach people for free the basics, how money works. You know, we've got Rishi Sunak saying, let's do maths until we're 18. Let's just stop calling it maths and call it financial education. I mean, I still yeah. agree when he it, said so that silly. you do maths I don't, because I've got a calculator for maths. Yeah. You know, and it's not exciting and not, not actually important and, and I mean that loosely there'll be people that need it if you go into certain uh, certain jobs you're going to need a certain level of mathematical understanding but business business financial literacy this is why I say everyone should be an entrepreneur because once you understand how money works everyone teaches you how to save a hundred pounds turn off your kettle turn, save a hundred pounds yeah. that was a big government campaign recently. yes it was it I'm was like, for god's sake let's teach people how to make a hundred pounds yeah and thanks to the social media platforms that everyone's so negative about you can actually make them really positive for you and you can turn them into assets in your life. You can not only put out content that's positive, which is what I try to do, you can also help yourself by making yourself having a life you want, doing something you love. And that, that's what I think is happening by the data. Absolutely. I think we also can't underestimate the value of applying that learning. You can sit in a class and you can be taught, you know, this is what saving is, this is what spending is, this is how you do a profit and loss sheet. What does that actually mean when you apply that knowledge? You know, I think you get a lot more out of the experience when you actually experience it for yourself and you realize, oh, this month we haven't made a profit or next month we need to actually make more in order to be able to cover our overheads. That kind of learning stays with you. And I think that actually encouraging children to start their own businesses and um, broaden that kind of understanding deepens their knowledge, which then will set them up for later on in life. Maybe they don't start a business themselves, but they understand how to manage their money in the home. Okay. Maybe, totally. And maybe, even if they're yeah. working for someone else, they still need to understand they're working for a business. And, and they need to great. understand their value and have yeah. options. How, where to, how yeah. to drive value in the business. Yeah. And even for themselves, like people, I think sometimes they don't, when they leave university, the thing I've noticed is that they don't feel like they've got any choice but to get a job. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that, as a, as a commodity, if you look at yourself as a commodity, you devalue yourself when that is your only option. Mm. You want to go into situations where you've got options, yeah, right? Yeah. That's, that's negotiation 101. If you want to get more value from your life, you need to have value. Yeah. And you need to say, I could start my own business or I could work for you. Yeah. And honestly, people always want to know what is the secret to getting rich. Actually, it's so obvious. No one seems to talk about it. It's own equity in a business. Yeah. That's it. If you look at the top 100 rich, they didn't make it in property, actually. I mean, you can make money in property, don't get me wrong. But property is not how you make money necessarily. You can own equity in a company and then you can buy property. Yeah. But I made my money owning equity in a company. Nearly everyone in the top 100 list made their money, initial money, having a business they had equity in. Mm. Yeah. So where you work, get equity in it. If you can't get equity where you work, go work somewhere where you can get equity in it. 
if the companies you're working for won't give you equity, go start your own business and work with your friend or your business partner, own equity, because that yeah. stuff is where the value is. Own a brand, not a business, I tell people, right? But a lot of people don't get this basic knowledge at school, and some people say there's a reason. Why is school not teaching this stuff? Absolutely. Why? Do you know the answer as to why? I have my paranoid reason. Yeah, I mean, it's mm. obvious, isn't it? They want people to be workers in companies. I think, Otherwise, why I wouldn't think... you update it? Well, I mean, I think it's very difficult to update the national, and I'm not a supporter, I'm 100% with you. I just think the practical reality of that is very, very difficult. But I do think it's, you know, very interesting to see that all these skills are being taught by regular people, the likes of me and you, who are just doing it off our own backs for free for the purpose of helping. I mean, that's an interesting situation, I think, for the government to reflect on, mm. as in who's educating people and what are, and why are they learning this? I think, Adele, coming back to what you said about that experience is so important. We, I mean, our feeds are inundated with messages from kids who've set up businesses. And there's some older kids on there who remember doing things like a simple bracelet stall or a lemonade stand or any of these very simple businesses that t kids tend to do. And they're all saying, I did this when I was 13, core memory, I've never forgotten mm. it. They all remember for their whole life that very first experience of creating something, taking it out to market and selling it. And I think, when it comes to options, they just know later on in life. It's not like I would think any kid needs to be out there hustling 24 hours a day at the age of nine to 13, but you want to give them the knowledge that they have an option that they can pull on at any point in life. Absolutely. I also think when you're a child, there's more kind of opportunity to try different things and to fail and pick yourself back up. Your story is really inspiring that you, know, you had no option yeah. but to succeed. But I think if you're a child and you, and you sort of think, or oh, maybe I will start a lemonade stand and maybe it doesn't go very well, you have the time and the experience to be able to try something different and actually learn that failing isn't necessarily a, a bad thing. I think from your story, you know, you've learned a lot from those experiences, which has enriched the business you're now doing. That's amazing. Why aren't we encouraging children to try things and fail or younger people to go into business? Maybe they don't succeed, but they learn the skills that makes their next business profitable. Maybe that encourages them to try something different and it is wildly successful in a way they never realized. But if we're afraid to fail or we don't give people those opportunities, they're not going to succeed at the 100%. end of the day as well. So our final example of how to turn £30 into £300 is the method of selling unwanted things. The things you've got, like, that you don't want anymore. Can it be my dad's car? <laughs> no, it can't be your dad's car. Will your <laughs> I don't think it can be your dad's car. So that was an excerpt from our lesson of selling unwanted things. Thoughts? I think you were wrong. He can definitely sell the car. Because, I mean, I would sell time of the car. The car sitting on the driveway not being used, you can sell that time. The car can be used, right? Because if he sells a TV, that TV did cost £1,000 and now he's selling it for £300 later. That's not actually making £300. But if he had a car that's sitting there making no money, turning that car into money, that's actually a really good idea. That is so, a brilliant idea. Yeah. I got it wrong. Hands yeah, up. Well, you know, totally this, this, we, 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 we all we all we all look at these things differently, I guess. Yeah. yeah. No, I think that's a great way of looking at it. Actually. Yeah, I would have explored that deeper with him. Like, OK, so when you say sell the car, talk to me more about that, because I think if you've got a car sitting there for one hour not being yeah. used, mm. that's probably 20 pounds. Someone will use it for an hour. Uh, and perfectly fits in today's sharing economy as well. And the totally, way in which exactly. these kids think, which you know, probably the opposite of me. I'm like, no, please don't sell your dad's car. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Selling the whole car, not a good idea, but <laughs> yeah. I can see it not being used a lot there's definitely some business in that that mm. I think that would have been interesting to explore brilliant amazing I think that finding things around the home maybe is a good way to kind of test the market especially if you're thinking about starting your own business taking things that you have at home that you don't use anymore maybe it's old toys or clothes and then selling them at car boot sales or at school kind of fairs could then be a good opportunity to see okay what's popular what did people buy maybe in the future you sell more of those items and you start your business that way once you know what people are looking for and and what is popular there's no point kind of investing a lot of money into a product buying a lot of stock to then find that there's no totally. demand and i think that it can be a good way especially if the items aren't being used anyway to sort of test and see is this something that could be profitable can i lean more into that should i avoid selling those items again. And there's certainly been a lot of young people who've progressed from selling their own trainers into actually trading in things like trainers and, yeah. and clothes and done incredibly well out of that. Absolutely, and I think you can't underestimate the value of having an interest yourself. I know someone um, who's a good friend of mine who sells clothes online because she loves clothes and so started um, expanding her wardrobe herself. Then she had too many items and she couldn't store them so she started selling them business started booming so now she buys them wholesale 
and um, models them herself, puts them on Depop, and then she's turning a nice profit as a, a side business. And actually that was all off the back of her own interest in clothing. And I think you're more successful when you enjoy what you're doing and you're enthusiastic about it. If that is something that gets you out of bed in the morning and you're passionate about, keep doing it. Yeah. This is, this is something we didn't talk in the uh, podcast, actually. It's something you're touching on here. It's really, really important. And um, I really believe in the unschooling model, you know, this 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 concept. But basically, it's it's where you follow the interest of the person, not a particular set of things you want to teach them. So my son, who's six, he loves maps, roadmaps, like obsessed with them. <laughs> so I, I leaned into it. He's like, oh, OK, Daddy, if we add the M25 to the A1, what do we get? I'm like, or the MA26, of course, <laughs> yeah. you know? So basically we're doing maths by accident. Yeah. And, then, and then he's like, well, how did the M25 get made, Daddy? So we Google it and it turns out the history, the politics, yeah. the finance, all of it. He's like obsessed. He's like, And that's me. really interesting and but, very but relevant. If I, if I told him maths and I, we're going to teach him maths now and then I'm going to talk politics, yeah. like, yeah. switch off. Yeah. Link it to roads yeah. is the most exciting thing in the world. Yeah. I yeah. think that's why entrepreneurship is so popular because as a concept now because you can follow your love you can follow your passion and then you learn accounts and yep. maths and learn all this business stuff that isn't that interesting in itself in isolation right to your point yeah. you know, she enjoyed clothes so that just a natural progression to then learn all the business aspects of it absolutely um yeah i was always interested in finance and personal finance and now you know as a personal finance reporter i get to do it every day yeah but it shouldn't be up to my own interest to go and learn and kind of pursue financial education i did so because i was passionate but not a lot of people are and we can't rely on that when educating young people about finance we need to be bringing that into schools in a better way we need to be doing that 100%. online more giving children role models like yourself that they can look up to and say i could do that one day i'm excited i'm going to give that a go um, and that is the future. So we've talking about the future, we've also been teaching the kids a lot about robots, AI, social media, all the sorts of things, Simon, you've referenced that we see as bad as adults, right, and very alarming. Uh, let's go to our next clip. What do we think a robot carer would not be very good at? It wouldn't be good at talking to the elderly because you don't really know their sort of ability. I feel like you would still feel a bit lonely because you're talking to a robot, not a human being. Like talking to AI, you're talking to a computer. It's not really helping with loneliness. It gives you stuff to do. It's not fully working. I think that's a really great point. They're like active moving, but actually they're not living. They weren't born. They weren't made from nature. So the robot's living, but it's not alive, is what you're saying. I agree. Loneliness and being cared for isn't really about people making other people do the work. It's about them going face to face with them, asking what their problems have been and like actually talking, not making them talk to someone who's not even alive. Oh, that's such a great answer. And you're so spot on with that. So Adele, what did you make of that? The kids' knowledge and understanding of the difference between AI robots in real life? I think it's exciting how enthusiastic they are about AI and, and robots and technology. A lot of people, as you said, are afraid of tech and the development of that in business and in the workplace, whereas actually we should be embracing technology and the opportunities that it can give us. AI is a powerful tool if used correctly. We just need to know how to bring it into the workplace and into business to optimize our productivity or to streamline the processes. And I think that the next generation are really excited about doing that and already are showing us that they know how to. And we have a lot that we can learn from them in that capacity. 100%. I mean, one place they haven't learned about AI and what's the difference between robot carers and what life is in, in compared to AI is in school. So the kids are obviously picking this up from social media. What are your thoughts on that clip? I'm 100% convinced AI will not take people's jobs, but those that use AI will. Yeah. So it's important to embrace it. Every single business I've been successful in is because I learned to replace myself in that business. So people are obsessed with keeping what they've got. The best way to be successful is actually learn to replace yourself. So if you embrace AI, you accept that it's going to replace certain jobs and prepare, you will win. It's those that aren't preparing for that change that I think will be in trouble. Great, let's look at our next clip. Do we think paintballing parks make a lot of money? It's kind of comparing to what you think is a profitable business. Exactly. If you're thinking a business that sold maybe over a million, you could think that's profitable. But if you're thinking a big business like Apple or Tesla, you think that's a profitable business, then 
definitely not. So it's dependable. I know people who go and do it like every weekend of the sport. If they get loads of people like that who are doing it every single weekend, they're going to make loads of money. Exactly. So I think it depends on a couple of things. Firstly, can you get customers who go all the time? And secondly, if you are the person who founded this, how much do you want to earn and how much do you want to make from your business? Because some people found businesses that make millions and millions and others found businesses that make a few hundred thousand and are really happy with that. And both of those outcomes are completely okay if that's what you want. So Simon, we look at business concepts that the kids will be familiar with, paintballing parks, trampolining parks, sort of places that they go and can understand because they've experienced them and then try and teach them from a concept they know, is this a good business? Is it profitable? What's, what's it likely to be like inside that business? What are your thoughts on that, Claire? So I've built lots of businesses that have been profitable and I've built lots of businesses that have not been profitable. I have actually enjoyed a lot of businesses that were not profitable, which is an interesting kind of, I guess, opposite. I think defining the word profit into purpose yeah. is more important than the amount of money you make. Yeah. In fact, here's the irony. I made the most amount of money when my businesses have had the most amount of purpose. Yeah. So, so like linking an outcome that isn't about making money to the success metric of the business is something I think we need to teach more about. 100%. And help people understand that it doesn't have to be a charity and you can be a for-profit company, but you do good with your profit. I think that's really powerful. And actually, ironically, you will make more profit if you have a purpose of what you're going to do with that profit that isn't just buy yourself a fancy house and a car and do, do something with that money that makes a difference. I think that's the future of business. And I also try and teach the kids that one person's definition of success is not everybody's and actually totally. mm. they can't you know you can look at an elon musk and if, if you're not interested do you in that, his, that's do you want his life? fine you know, you know you, it's you like, look at people's lives yeah. and see if you actually want that we lifestyle and, you know? yeah we try and teach them that they have to determine in their own heads what success is going to look like to them and move towards that and not worry about what a conventional sort of measure of success might look like because everybody yeah, and financial measure is, I think, a dangerous measure just to keep it a financial measure. Yeah. Again, people won't want to fail because they'll think it's about making money. And I know plenty of businesses that have failed did a lot of good until they failed. 100%. And when we're, when we're rating businesses, we look at things like, are they nice places to work? How are they contributing to the community? Profit is one element of, a, of the overall thing that we're looking at. Adele, what do you think about? Yeah, absolutely. I think um, there's so much value in small businesses. Like 99% of the businesses in the UK are small businesses. As you've said, you know, you might think you want to run a multinational, but actually the labor and the unpredictability and managing a workforce and what have you takes away from maybe the reason you would start the business in the first place. And you'd be better off running a small business where you're closer to the objective and, and the purpose. I think um, being motivated by profit itself isn't enough to keep you getting up in the morning and spending the time and, and hours and manpower and investment to keep the business going. And you need to really identify what it is that you want to get out of that business, whether it's big or small. 100%. And just before we wrap up, what's your final message to all those enterprising kids out there across the UK, Adele? Keep going, I think. This is just the start if you want it to be. Keep going and don't give up and um, eventually you'll get there. And Simon? Purpose of life is a life with purpose. Do something you really love and you will make money and you'll have a good life. Brilliant. Thank you so much to both of you. Thank you. Mm -hmm.